issues that are out on TV pretty much, even the ones that ain't on TV, I've been discussing with a lot of people. I don't just go seek these people. Like, we find each other or we already know each other and we find something to talk about, like with these issues. But one of them being uh, mental illness, mental health, uh, suicide, self-esteem, like it's a whole long list of different issues that we face that myself and uh, conversating a lot of my people about out in the streets, when I'm out and about or wherever I am, it finds me. So, you know, that's my life's work. But you want to tell us what you do? Um, yes, um, I am a licensed special social worker and I work for the state of Tennessee where I um, supervise a team of workers that investigate child abuse. Um, so that's pretty much what I do. Um, we do work with children and families. When you hear children's services, you more so think just children, but um, I do serve you know, children and families and also work within the community. Okay, well, what you doing is, what you doing it consistently, mm -hmm. it's your profession. Uh, I'm sure you see the changes, when things spike up or when things go down or whatever. Uh, just curiosity that we got to ask you. During this corona, during the corona pandemic, uh, I just always been curious because it's weird. Well, it's not weird, it's weird for some. What's going on with it? With people coming home with majority the workers being able to do their work at home and you having a whole lot of after effects a lot of reactions to that action happening you got parents who having to go fix their children who who kind of got accustomed to you know letting the schools raise their children and they they having to face and deal with that like that's something that's going on uh, that's a life changer it's a curse for some, it's a blessing for others. This is what some been praying for, this is what others uh, don't want. Same thing with spouses, you know, you have spouses, that going on, it being a blessing for some, a curse for others. I can go on and on. So like we all going through the changes as we go. So I just wanna ask you, you being in that, as far as abuse go, is it a spike in abuse? Like, what kind of effect has this pandemic been having on homes? Okay. As far as abuse goes. As abuse goes, when, it, when we're talking about child abuse, um, well, that's my that's my profession, so I'm gonna say child abuse. But um, like you pretty much said, abuse is it's pretty much more than just that. That ultimately leads to child abuse. Um, but I will say since the pandemic with COVID-19, um, when it first um, hit us, things were kind of quiet because um, everybody was kind of shut in, you know, you pretty much didn't go anywhere, you didn't do anything, and there was limited conversation with outside people other than just within your, your own home environment. So it was kind of quiet when it first hit, but once, you know, as time kind of moved on and they opened the city back up in those different phases that's when things started to spike is simply because now it's open you're talking to more people you're out more um and things are being told now because there are more eyes and there's more ears involved now because it's open right. um and 
I'm gonna go back to what you mentioned as far as you know parents allowing the schools to raise their children so a lot of times prior to COVID-19 we would get a lot of referrals during school yeah. um, the, the length of school when school is open um, simply because children go home things happen you go to school you got someone to talk and tell yeah. So that that was your that was their protection when they were at school. Mm -hmm. um, so we were able to do more because there were more eyes and there were more ears. Um, but like I, I would say, pretty much during COVID nineteen when everything just shut down, you didn't hear anything, mm -hmm. um, and it almost make you think. You know, back in the old days when people would go on in this house, stay in this house, and mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what was happening when COVID-19 first hit and you were on that shutdown. But now that things have, like I said, but now that things have opened back up, you have more eyes and more ears because children are seeing other family members. Um, children are able to kind of get out and go to a park, whatever. And so people see the abuse and now they're able to report it so that we can do something about it. So mm. it's, 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 it's a rise now yeah. being that, you know, the phases, have you know they've done phase one two and three here well we haven't quite gotten to three yet we're on our way for three um where everything is pretty much opening back up so more people are, are able to report what they see and what they hear or even what they know okay well thank you for that mm -hmm. see that was just my little curiosity because <laughs> i do social experiments based on the things that are going on out there because not to get off of that, but still on that. But the same way you had a disease, which is one thing. Hmm. And all of the fuss is around the disease. But there's so much going on around it that makes the disease itself really sit on the background. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because you got misdiagnosing going on. You got uh, misusing the funds in the name of uh, COVID-19, but it's really for whatever. You got people getting shot. <laughs> you got people getting shot and it's turning out to be COVID-19. So you got a lot of stuff that's going on. Then you got the things that we're talking about going on. Like that's just another reaction to the action or whatever. Uh, it goes on and on. But okay, since I have you here in the seat, what about Not only is it the epidemic, we got we have this old epidemic that's been going on of uh, brutality and all that. Do you ever? Yeah. So I'm just curious. Is that something that they express to you in your line of work? Do the children express that to you? Signs of uh, the trauma that they see going on with brutality, police brutality, the police shootings, or even Hell, the black on black crime. I'm like, do they express any of that to you? Um, in my realm of work, I'm gonna say no. Um, pretty much because with with what I deal with, the children are dealing with what's going on in their home. So they're more consumed with how do I get out of this situation? How do I get help from what's going on within my home environment? And when they're so consumed with the abuse that they're enduring within their home environment, they're not thinking about what's going on in the outside world. Um, I think it's, it's, it would be almost too much for a child to express what that, because more than likely they're hearing it from a parent or they're hearing it from a family member um, or that they, some teenagers um, may see it on social media, but when it, as it relates to child abuse, they're more so trying to figure out how do I get out of this abusive situation? Or how do I get help with what's going on within my own home? That's interesting. I mean, it makes sense. I thought maybe they would have, but, but like you said, I guarantee that if I see it, they see it. Oh yeah. Yeah, Definitely. you know they see it, Definitely. you know they hear it. And we in the age of social media, so they see 10 times more than we seen on the screen when we was young. Because we did it from around the world. But, uh, so 
that's a whole other thing. That means it's something that they not talking about. Because they're dealing with their own fears or their own present battle, I guess you would say. So yeah. I mean me, I study psychology, but I don't study it. I never went to school for anything but as far as the the makeup of the mind and what keeps the mind stable and what stimulates it and all of these things. Like, like, that's my thing. Like, that's what I do. Learning myself and learning how to interact with other people. Seeing people's weaknesses, their strengths, learning who is the strong mind out of the group, who is the more weaker mind, who is more susceptible to influences, you know, all of this. But uh, stability, that's dealing with mental stability. So, besides all these children, what is their stability like, mental stability? Okay, and, and, I, and I know you're touching on mental health, so let me, let me, let me say this. Usually, and I'm, I'm not saying this is with every child abuse case, but usually abuse stems from some type of problem. Um, and, and we're talking about parent problem. And that comes from drug abuse. That comes from uh, mental health issues. That comes from um, genetic or uh, family dynamic issues. This is what my parents did to me. I'm doing it to my child. So it's, it's like a, a, a cycle, a cycle, a family cycle. I think I'm using the right words. Um, um, it, it stems from, and, and really, to be honest, the, the two main problems are substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, usually one, one who has mental health issues turn to substance abuse to help deal with their mental health issues. And then when you use drugs, that ultimately makes you become aggressive or abusive. Um, when you do have mental health issues, that then turns into aggression or abusive because you're trying to figure out a way to help yourself deal with what's going on, with, with what's going on within your mind. Um, so a lot of children are victims of those issues or those problems from their parents. Like I said, whether it's substance abuse, mental health issues, or even just a, a cycle, a family cycle, um, a family dynamic cycle where, I mean, like I said, and, and I'm speaking this because I am a parent myself, I can sit here and honestly say I grew up getting spankings or butt whoopings yeah. um, when, when there was a need to correct or, or to discipline your child. Um, so in turn, guess what I do to my own child? When he's out of line and he needs to be corrected, I will spank him. But some people may go a little too far, maybe you know a little bit more behind, like I said, when it comes to being mentally ill, whether you're bipolar, whether you're depressed, um, or you know, hey, I have a substance abuse problem that can be drugs or alcohol. So I may take my, my my issues or my problems out on my child a little bit too much. Um, so when you say, you know, problems, we get those cases where parents do have a problem that has ultimately resulted in abuse. Not only that, but children have problems too where they suffer from mental health issues. Um, and I can say this, within my 12 years of experience, children who do have uh, mental health issues, they're hard to diagnose. So you have a doctor, I would say experimenting, trying to figure out what's going on with this child. And of course, nowadays, you can put them on some type of medicine. Right. So when you put them on a medicine, you're creating a chemical imbalance. So when you're creating a chemical imbalance, you're gonna get a different reaction, and then on top of another reaction, and then you got a frustrated parent who's trying to figure out how do I deal with my child? I'm getting the medical advice that I need, or I'm getting the mental health advice that I need, but people still aren't really able to clearly understand what's going on to give them a proper diagnosis or to give them the proper help that they need. So now you just have, what someone say, a juvenile delinquent. 
that who in turn have mental health issues because their parents have it. And then ultimately turn to drugs and alcohol because that's their way of coping with it. So it can be a vicious cycle. And that's pretty much what I was saying. And that's more than likely the cases that we get is a cycle because I can say this, if we have a case on the parent, guess what? Nine times out of 10, we have a case on them when they were children or when their parents were children. It's that, that whole that whole genetic, I mean, you know, it. We children tend to do what their parents do. Unless, you know, you just have to be one, hey, I'm not gonna do this, I'm gonna be different. I'm there to be different than what I've been, what I've been brought up in. And that happens. But a lot of times, if that's all you know, that's all you're gonna do. If that's all you see, that's all you're gonna do. And then if you see your parents are okay with it, or even your other family members are okay with it, why not? Why? What's wrong with me doing it? Alright. It's shaping and formed by our environment. Mm -hmm. Like you said, right. We have those very few. Probably one out of 20, one out of whatever. Big number. There are always many. Like I was talking about before, there are always many calls. Few children. Yes, those right. few who would be different. Who would move around uh, the gene pool if it's corrupted or move around whatever on their own path. But it's a real thing though. So in conclusion, like what are kind of what are like well I know personal stuff is confidential between you and your clients, but as far as like I know you have a heart. Yeah, I know you have a heart. So I'm sure you offer them some kind of advice, like outlets. Like what would you tell people who uh, have been too personal? Like what would you tell or what would you tell? No, what would you tell? Hypothetically, what would you tell a child who, who's dealing with not just abuse. Since, yeah, you're gonna be hypothetical here. What would you tell a child? What are you stepping out of your job for a minute? Just okay. you as a person, what are you telling the world? Work off. <laughs> what are you telling the child, children in the world, or adults in the world? But like, what would you tell people? What is your advice to people who are dealing with challenges of pressure? Uh, Things that's going on in the world, uh, the killers, the senseless killers. Um, I almost want to say to children, I almost want to say specifically to black children who had the most traumatic times, you know what I mean, generation, because they can be two years old, they can be a two year old, fresh on fresh on the planet, but you would think they have a clean slate. But people who don't understand generational uh, curses. Well, what would they call curses? But as far as like genetic trauma and how it's passed on. Like a two year old who you would think have a clean slate already have genes in them that would respond to trauma if they see it again. You know what I mean? Like if they see it in their life, which is something that is done purposely. Why you see so many uh, black men get killed on TV. You know what I mean? Like YouTube will ban you for, you know, it happens like that. You know what I mean? They'll ban you for cussing sometimes on certain things, but they'll show you somebody get gunned down in cold blood and no sense. And you wonder, like, why? But when you see this over and over and over and over, and you got a genie in you that responds to trauma. That's all the trauma, the lynchings, and the is in me. Like, I study genius, and that's how it works. So that's why you get a slave movie every year, or not two of them, a series of them, to keep impressing upon the mind this image, this image. <clears throat> that's why you get all the gangster movies. Like, all the different roles. I grew 
grew up on too. But as far as like, that's why they push you a certain narrative so hard because they want to impress a certain image upon your mind. They show you a hundred slave movies. But the Nat Turner movie, uh, Birth of a Nation, got boycotted. Damn it. You know what I mean? Like, it was almost boycotted. But they didn't even want one movie to show you fighting back. You know what I mean? That's all done intentionally. And there's a bigger plan going on. So just being aware of all of that, what would you say to not just black males, but to the black youth to have to see these things all around, uh, have to come into the world with what appears to be cause, you know what I mean, a bad hand dealt even though there's a flip side, but there's an illusion. And there's an image that's given to most of us that if you ain't one of them chosen few or whatever, man, like this is what you're gonna be susceptible to. Like this is what you're gonna be influenced by. But to that youth, like what kind of advice would you give them as far as like dealing with these pressures? Girl, I don't know if my question was too broad. <laughs> But as far as like, just what kind of advice would you give to you that's dealing with some of these pressures, whether it be at home, what they see outside in the streets, or what they see on the screens, like all of the craziness that's going on, that'll make people for stability unstable. First, shout out, happy Juneteenth. My black is beautiful. Hey. Yo. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I would definitely tell my little black people boys and girls, I think I would more so ask the question, what you see, how does that make you feel? And if you're hurt, angry, upset, or whatever feeling that you may have back, how can you make it feel? If, it's, if, it, if it makes you feel bad, how can we make it happen? And I know we've been taught so many different things, and of course, they're gonna, of course, and, and I, I'm, I'm gonna speak personal, but at the same time, I'm gonna speak on a professional level. On a professional level, your coach will be seek out mental health professionals. But sometimes that's not always the answer. Because ultimately, when you seek out that mental health professional, they're gonna lead you to some type of medication because they think that there's something wrong with you. So, first, let me say, figure out what it is, what is your happy place. What is it that can make you happy? Or what is it that can make you better than what you see? How can your actions be different where you're not put in a situation to feel so fearful that if I'm stopped by the police or if I protest or if I voice how I feel about my blackness, you're not going to be punished for that. How can you do that in a positive way? So, like I said, I will most definitely um, tell my little black boys and girls, um, you are beautiful, you are strong, and you are different. Um, don't be afraid or ashamed of who you are. Um, don't think that where you come from is where you're gonna stay. Um, you're gonna dare to be different. And not to, not to get too personal about my own situation, but when I think about my mother's children, I was the first to graduate high school. But I could have had that same mentality as my brother and my sister and say, what, what is school? Why do I need a high school diploma? But me getting a high school diploma got me to be, it helped me to think, okay, well, I can go higher than this. Let me go get a college degree. Let me get a college degree so that I can be a professional. I can go higher than this. Um, be who you want to be. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't be it. Don't feel that, like I said, that you have to be in a sunken place or, or like your, your um, what you say, your, your general, now I don't want to say a generational curse, but be what you came from. You can always be different. Um, you can be better. Um, I have a son, so I'm always telling him, I want you to be better than me. I think I'm in a good place, but I want you to be better than me. I want you to be proud of who you are. Don't ever feel ashamed of the color of your skin what you can do or um, don't be fearful of who you are 
Um, but it's, it's definitely going to start within yeah. and, and them building themselves up and to know that you can be better. But I can't say this, children um, get power or the, let's see, or they feel empowered when they hear it from who they love. And that's your, that's your parent, that's your grandma, that's your family, that can be your friends. So, in all, let's practice love. You know what I'm saying? Let's love one another. Let's love each other. Let's get this hate out of heart. We've already dealt with enough hate for years. Again, happy Juneteenth. You know what I'm saying? So let's 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 react different. Let's let's um let's act in a different way. Yet peaceful, but saying don't be don't be scared. Right. Don't be don't don't fear because that's what they want us to do. Right. Is be fearful of who we are or what you could be. Yeah. I appreciate that. See, the reason why I want to ask that people know they know I'm definitely uh, one who advocates the self love. And hey, the only people who have problems with that, well, should nobody have a problem with no one loving themselves or standing up for themselves. The only people who have a problem with someone standing up for themselves is the one trying to get over. You know what I mean? So. All that aside, the reason why I asked specifically about the young black boys and girls because when it comes to mental health, like we all have a brain yes. and we all have access to a mind. So certain topics are universal, but I'm going to get specific right now, especially due to the occasion that it is June 10th. And uh, not only that, it's my brain. Not only that, we had the most work done on us. You know what I mean? Like nobody else had the baggage that we had. So it's like when it comes to mental health, that's a whole other segment. When you get oh, yeah. dealing with that post traumatic slave disorder, you know what I mean? That trauma. That plays a part in how we deal with each other today, how we shock with each other, how we trust each other, how we look at each other. You know what I mean? Like it's a relation between all of us. The crime rate, the murder rate, yeah. Because nothing naturally kills itself off. Nothing in nature kills itself off. The first law of nature is self-preservation. So whenever you see something wiping off itself, literally, or things that look like it, hey, right? like say no more. Like it's a uh, self-hate thing going on. And that's the same self-hate that'll make me go 20 miles across town before I spend with you. Because I see you how I see me down here. And I see them across town up here. Mm. Above me. It's all psychological displays. You know what I mean? And this is all mental health. So we're going to do a mental health month or a week or whatever we got to do. Yes. To get a series out and break it down section by section. Just mm -hmm. dealing with the children. You know what I mean? Like, hey, appreciate you sharing with us. Yes, sorry with love. It all starts with love. And I will say this too. Um, you know, teach and and I'm, and I what I was speaking on was how do you empower children, you know to deal with these things that um, we have going on. And I'm gonna say this, parents, talk to your children. Talk to them, let them talk to you. And that's the problem is that we have held so much in that it's bottled up and when it's, when it's time to come out, we react in a way that we have no self-control. So it's best to talk about it, let's get it out, let's deal with it. But at the same time, deal with it in a loving way. Right. Um, and let's get this this hate. Yes. Out. And that's all I can think about is, um, you know, I know we're talking about just mental health and all, but just in general, just learn a, a better way to deal with your issues or your problems. But think, but think of it and do it in a loving way, and not in a in a hating manner. Or I want to be better than them. Or you know. Um, 
uh, it, jealousy and envy. Don't do it in a jealousy and envy type of way because jealousy and envy is also a form of hate. Yeah. Um, so again, I would just say, you know, talk, talk, and that's the thing with mental health. Even when you go see a mental health professional, they gonna do all they're gonna do is sit you down, and talk to a counselor. And when we make contact with families and children, guess what we're gonna do first? We're gonna sit down, we're gonna talk to you to hear your side of the story, what's bothering you, and how can I help you with this situation. So if you can talk about it and figure out a way to do it in a loving way, it'll, it'll, it'll make a, a world of difference. It's real. It's real. Just as what I said about what a doctor does. They can't come and diagnose you off the rip. Right. They gotta let you talk to them. Uh, you're gonna tell them, whether it's symbolically or little. Once they open their mouth, you're either gonna see whether you're using it as a real doctor, a medical doctor, or just a doctor who heals, whether mentally or spiritually, whatever. When the person open their mouth, you're going to see their health or you're going to see their sickness by what comes out of their mouth. And when it comes out, it's coming from within. And so it's like when we know this is where the sickness is. Then you can die. Right. Right. What's going on? It is. And like you said, it's a world with love and to open the vow. Like, that's the issue I dealt with myself. I'm not much of a talk. That's why me doing this, like, I, I ain't been much of a talker. I'm a builder. You know what I mean? I haven't been much of a, a communicator. But uh, I normally let things build up instead of putting it out. Like, opening that valve, releasing the pressure instead of letting it explode on you. So that makes a lot of sense, and like you said, do it with love. And like the sister said over here, the quote about the hate being a heavy, heavier burden, burden to carry. Yes. Right. So it's better to do it with love. Like that's real. It ain't just something that sounds sweet, but these are universal laws. You know what I mean? If you learn, learn no energy.